Well, welcome everybody and lovely to be here with you. My name is Tina Rasmussen and um, Rick has asked me to come and talk with you about the Samatha practice for the next, for this week and next week. So I'll be, uh, so tonight I'm going to actually talk about the practice a little bit before we do the sitting. So I'll give the talk and then take any questions about the actual practice and then we'll do our sit. And then, um, and then we'll have time for some more questions as well. So that way, if you do want to do the practice, you have the instructions to do it. Not required, you can do whatever you practice you want. But um, this is a wonderful ancient practice and um, it's spelled S-A-M-A-T-H-A, -A -A, pronounced Samatha. And the word Samatha is a Pali word, which was the language that um, the Buddhist teachings were recorded in. And it really means um, serenity and concentration. So sometimes people think that um, it means just concentration and the serenity part of the practice gets lost. And so I really like to emphasize that this is a practice for both concentration and serenity. And I mean, this is a really great time in the world for this practice because the world is so chaotic right now and um, you know who couldn't use a little bit more serenity these days so anyway this is a practice of concentration and serenity and rick told me he um, just to give you a little background rick and i have been friends for about 15 years and i teach with him at his neurodharma retreat and um, i've been teaching for about about 15 years in the US and Europe. Oh, and I was told I should put my website in the chat. So I'm going to do that in case anybody wants it later. Um, and I teach many practices, but the Samatha is the practice I started teaching and I've also written a book about it. So why this practice? What's compelling about it? And I do a lot of different practices, the Pasana, I do Tibetan Buddhist meditation, um, the Brahma Viharas, the heart practices, uh, yoga, Qigong. So like many of you, you know, you may do a lot of different practices and I think it's, um, you know, it's good to have a well-rounded practice. So what, what does this practice offer in particular? Why would one maybe wanna consider adding this to what you're doing? And, you know, rotating it into your, um, your practice lineup, you know, in a way, what does it offer? And, you know, as I started doing this practice, I'd already been a meditator for about 20 years by the time I came across this practice. And the more I started learning and reading about it, the more compelling it became. And part of the reason for that is because of the Buddha himself. The Buddha, um, when he, he was from, uh, he was a prince, he was from a, a wealthy family that had a kingdom, and he was very sheltered in his life. And at some point, he, um, he got out behind the walls of the palace and started seeing the suffering in the world. And that was really part of what compelled him to undertake his own search, to which he ended up becoming a teacher that we can all benefit from today. But, you know, like, just like we might do, he went out and he found the best teachers of the day. When he started on his own path, he went and looked around to find the best teachers. And the two teachers that actually taught the Buddha taught him this practice. This is the practice that he learned from them. And a lot of people, you know, this practice is also in the Hindu path. And people think that this, may, this practice may have been around for as much as 5,000 years. So, you know, why would something last 5,000 years? That's a long time. And um, it's because it works. If it didn't work, there's no way it would have lasted 5,000 years. It would have gone into obscurity. So just like in the day of the Buddha, uh, the, this practice can really help us um, go beyond the discursive chatter of the mind. 
So another thing, you know, again, when we look at the Buddhist path, this is part of what makes this practice compelling to me at least, is that not only did he learn it from his teachers, the Buddha added Vipassana to this. So he learned this and then he added the Vipassana, which is really his contribution. Um, but he continued to do this practice through his whole life. Even as a fully enlightened being, he did this practice every year. Um, it said that this was the, the practice he did many times on his three month rains retreat. And some of the scholars think it, may, it was his favorite practice. So I kind of like that. We don't know for sure. But clearly it was important to him. And not only did he do it through his life, but at the moment of the Buddha's death, and he had predicted his own death. He, he knew it was coming. And when it happened, he was on his deathbed. He knew he was going to die imminently. He could have done any meditation practice. And what practice did he choose to do? He did the Samatha practice. So, you know, we can't know why he did that. But to me, those were all compelling reasons. If it was this important to him, isn't it worth us considering you know, undertaking this practice. So at a more practical level, other reasons to do the practice are that um, it, it does cultivate, well, there's four things, serenity, concentration, purification of mind. And the fourth is called what I call the thinning of the me. And I'll describe each of these. So serenity, you know, we're really in a time where things are pretty, um, pretty chaotic. And oh, somebody's asking me to spell the name of the practice. So let me do that. S-A-M-A-T-H-A. -A -A. There we go. Um, you know, it's, it's a hard time in the world right now. Things seem to be getting a little bit better, but who doesn't need a little more serenity? And so this practice, and I'll, I'll get into what we're actually doing, which um, is, it's a breath meditation. So, you know, as we just come back to the breath over and over, it's very soothing. And the breath is, you know, the breath is keeping us alive. So there's a way that being in touch with that and coming back to it can really um, give us a place of rest and peace and um, tranquility in a difficult day. And so serenity is really one of the main reasons to do this practice. Concentration, this is known as a concentration practice. And so in that, it's really bringing the mind stream together. Concentration practices have um, one object that they focus, that we focus our attention on to the exclusion of everything else. And so in doing that, the mind stream really comes together and unifies in a way that potentially, if the practice goes deep enough, can be quite powerful. And I'll get to that in a minute, but um, any concentration practice, and this one in particular is, is considered very accessible um, to more people because we are using the breath, which is with us all the time. We don't have to do anything to have it be there. And so as the mind stream comes together in this practice, we're really cultivating that capacity that we can then use in other meditations or in our regular everyday life. I don't know if any of you have seen these, you know, headlines or some of the books that have come out on the neuroscience, I mean, this is where the neuroscience becomes really interesting, where books like The Shallows, and um, you know, I know Rick talks about these things, uh, our tech-driven culture is making it where it's actually changing the gray matter of the brain and our, um, our, our neuro, our synapses, to where it's harder to concentrate because there's so many distractions. And we're, we've all become unwitting kind of guinea pigs to this grand experiment called tech integration into our device, into our life. And, you know, I love my cell phone as much as anybody else, but it's actually changing our brains to where, you know, I, I have a really thick file of, of neuroscience articles 
And I've seen several with the title, something like, I've lost the ability to read. And what the authors of these articles are saying is that they can't stay with like a book long enough because we're so used to just hot linking from one thing to another and doing just little sound bites to where we can't actually go deeper. And the neuroscience is showing that this is really true. So this is a practice that can offset that, um, uh, that tendency for the shallows, for us to just skim along the surface and not be able to really stay with something, to turn our attention to stay with something like at work, you know, or, or if, start, if you're writing something, we need that. That's a capacity that we really need in life. So this can be very practical. The next is purification of mind. So now we're getting a little bit more into the mystical um, aspects of the practice. In the Buddhist texts, this section of the path is called purification of mind. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is that um, when we meditate, which we'll have a chance to do in a little bit, one of the things we find right away is that we go off into thoughts. We, we lose track of whatever the object of the meditation is and we find that we're, we're thinking. So really what that's showing us is our compulsive thought patterns. And they're compulsive because if they weren't compulsive, we'd be able to just stay with the breath. So we're seeing that and the Samatha practice will help us see it really quickly. What are my patterns? So you're not doing it wrong if that happens. This is part of it. It's actually helpful to see what our patterns are because most of the time these are always going on. It's not until we meditate that we see them. They're going on all day long. They're going on while you're at work, while you're driving. They're going on unconsciously. So by meditating, we can actually see what they are. And then by coming back to the breath, we are deconditioning the compulsiveness of those thoughts. Because a lot of those thoughts are, are they're we're ruminating. They're the same thoughts over and over. And again, the um, neuroscience shows that our thoughts, 80 to 90% of them are repetitive. They're the same thought we had yesterday and last week and last month and last year and five years ago and 10 years ago and when we were 10 years old, same category. You know, some people go into planning, some fantasize, some beat themselves up, you know, but we each have our top 10 songs. You know, that if we really look at it, we can see that in meditation. So purification of mind means that we are challenging those patterns. So basically, we're getting a software upgrade to our consciousness where we are both the program and the programmer. You know, just by coming back to the breath over and over, we're changing those um, neural pathways that if we've run over them millions and millions of time, they're going to be really thick. And if that's a pathway about, oh, I didn't do it right. Why did I do it that way? Or, you know, we're beating ourselves up. Or if it's a pathway about, um, uh, you know, ruminating about something we need to do in the future, and maybe it, we're a little nervous about it. All of these kinds of pathways are contributing to our anxiety and suffering. So by challenging those, it gives us the option to not go there. And that's part of the software upgrade. So we're deconditioning our habitual thought patterns. That's part of the purification of mind. And then the last reason to do this practice is what I call the thinning of the me. So this is really Again, this is on the more mystical end of things, but in Buddhism, really freedom is seen as being less and less identified with our story and with that, set, that habitual sense of me that's made up of self-images and beliefs and the inner critic and um, our body image. And at death, you know, all of those things are not gonna be there. So Buddhism gives us a chance to know what we are beyond the body and beyond our personality. Is there something deeper that we are that we can actually know through meditation and spiritual practice while we're still alive? 
And that's what the Buddha said. You know, he said, don't take my word for it, see for yourself. So um, this practice helps with the thinning of the me so that we can know our deeper nature directly, rather than believing that all we are is the body and the personality. There's something that we are that the Buddha pointed to over and over that is unconditioned, that is a mystery. But we can know that. We can know that what we are through spiritual practice and through meditation, and this is part of the thinning of the me. So where does this fit then in the, you know, the scheme of um, Buddhist practice? And I'll, I'll stick mainly to the Theravadan Buddhism since that's where Rick really um, mostly you know, focuses. So there's three stages of practice in, in Theravadan Buddhism. And those are sila, samatha, and vipassana. And I'll just quickly go through these so you can see like where does this fit. So sila, it, again, these are Pali words. Um, sila is, I like to think of it being translated as wholesome living. So this is really living in such a way that we feel is congruent with who we are at our best inside and who we have feel that we have, you know, what we have touched into in our deepest meditation and spiritual practice. Am I living from that? Am I really living my life in such a way that um, as two teachers that I am fond of, Steve Armstrong and Kamala Masters say, living in harmony without regret. Am I living in harmony without regret so that I, when I go to meditate, I'm not, you know, thinking, I'm not filled with remorse or wishing I'd done things differently. I can actually sit and not have those things disturbing me. And so that I'm not doing harm um, in the world. So I'll go through the words again. Sila is the first, and this is really wholesome living. S-I-L-A is how that's spelled. The next is Samatha, which I already put in there, S-A-M-A-T-H-A. And that's the practice we're doing tonight, this, the concentration and serenity practice. And then the last is Vipassana, and also known as insight meditation. And um, a lot of the mindfulness is really in the Vipassana realm. So, um, so the Samatha is what we're really focusing on tonight. That's the second part of the Buddhist path. And this is the serenity, the concentration, purification of mind. Really what, it's a very inward practice. So we're really orienting in this practice to being with ourselves in the quiet, coming back to this object of meditation, which is the breath over and over. And then we're seeing what our patterns are and we're challenging those so that we're not just dominated by them that there can be some freedom from them through the software upgrade that we're basically getting by turning back to the breath instead of just believing the thoughts and, and being completely identified with them. That's really what's happening when we're trying to meditate and thought comes, uh, thoughts come and we go there and we lose our meditation object. That means we're identified with the thoughts to the point where um, we it's compulsive, basically. And so in the Samatha, we're challenging those patterns and we're building the muscle of concentration and that powerful mind stream that isn't just lost and dominated by our compulsive thought patterns. And then in Vipassana, so this is the third stage and it's spelled V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. It's the most common kind of meditation taught in um, a lot of the centers in the US, at least in the Theravadan tradition. And Vipassana, really what we're developing there is the ability to be with what's arising in our meditation. So we're not just focusing on the breath there. There's a lot of things we focus on. And it's really more like noticing what is predominant in the mind stream. So like mindfulness, if, if you 
you know, put mindfulness in a category, be in the Vipassana category, where we're noticing what's happening as it's happening. And we're trying to um, notice it without becoming completely identified with it. And also to not be overly attached to the pleasant things to not push away the unpleasant things and to not be bored with the neutral things. That's what we're doing in Vipassana. So it's cultivating the capacity to be with things as they are. That's really what we're cultivating in Vipassana. And that's important too. So all three of these stages, Sila, Samatha and Vipassana are, are valuable and worth doing, um, but they aren't, they're different. You know, they're each cultivating different things. So, um, so then I'm gonna talk about what we're actually doing in the Samatha practice. And then um, I'll take some questions before we do the meditation. So Samatha, which is the concentration and serenity meditation. And I'm seeing people are asking how it's spelled again. So I'll do that again. S-A-M-A-T-H-A. -A -A. Um, really, anytime we're meditating, one way to think about this is that one of two things is happening, regardless of what meditation, it's not just Samatha, it's any meditation, either transformation or transcendence is happening. So transformation or transcendence. So what do I mean by that? Transformation is when we're seeing our personality patterning that's taking us off of the object of the meditation, you know, our thought patterns, basically, or emotions or whatever's there that's taking us off. And we're challenging the compulsive, habituated nature of those patterns. That's transformation because we're basically transforming the personality so that there's more freedom in it. So that's happening when the meditation is a little hard and we're challenging those patterns or transcendence is happening. So in transcendence, we're starting to find some, some quiet. You know, maybe there's some periods where the thinking is stiller and there's some peace or there's space, there's no thoughts or there might be some joyful feelings. So all of these are access to our deeper nature. And that can go very, very deep. In the Samatha practice, I won't get into how deep it can go, but there are um, some extremely um, purifying states that can arise with this practice that are um, really transformative. So basically transformation and transcendent, one of those two is always happening when you're meditating. You're either working with your personality patterns or you're in touch with your deeper nature where there's peace and serenity and some freedom. So um, that's part of what's happening here. And then the big picture overview of the practice, really it's very simple. In any concentration practice, we're coming back to one object of meditation to the exclusion of everything else. So here it's the name of the practice. It's a mindfulness of breathing practice. And we're coming back to the breath in, in this area here that's between the upper lip and the nostril. So it's kind of, you know, like here from the side and wherever it's easiest to notice the breath in there. It could be a particular spot. It could be the general area. The object is the breath, but we're knowing it in that area. And it's a present moment practice. Any, any real meditation is always, um, present moment. It's trying to bring us into the present moment, which is really where all of the, uh, all the good stuff happens. You know, any, any real meditation is trying to help us be present with what's here right now. And um, so we're focusing on this object of awareness to the exclusion of everything else. So basically, we're coming back to that 
and we don't have to push away anything else, but we're just not giving it energy. We're, you know, deconditioning the compulsiveness of the thought patterns that like in Buddhism, the first noble truth is the truth that as long as we're identified with our, the ego self and our thought patterns, we are going to suffer more than necessary. So um, it's really designed to give us some freedom from that. So we have the choice so that it's not so compulsive. So we're bringing our awareness back to the breath, to the exclusion of everything else. And this is really um, building the muscle of concentration. So we, Concentration is a natural faculty that everybody has as part of their awareness, but it's just like a physical muscle. Like when you go to the gym um, and you, you know, say try to lift a five pound weight or 10 pound weight, at first a 10 pound weight might feel really heavy, but as you do more repetitions, it becomes more and it becomes more and more easy to lift and it feels lighter. And this is really what we're doing with our consciousness with the Samatha practice, with the concentration, is we're doing repetitions of coming back to the breath and, um, and turning away from the compulsive thought patterns and just resting with the breath, which is really, you know, this is a big part of the serenity, is that the breath is keeping us alive and being in touch with that can really, um, give us a place to return to in the grocery line at a red, you know, at a stoplight in a meeting and feel the serenity of just simply being with the breath. So in the Anapanasati, we are just coming back to the breath. That's really the, you know, it's not easy to do, but it is a simple instruction. And we don't follow the breath into the body. We don't follow it out. We're just being with the breath in this area. And really the most common question about this is what if I can't feel the breath? So this is where there's a metaphor uh, called the toll taker. And in the Bay Area where I live, um, the San Francisco Bay Area, we have a lot of bridges and there used to be people who took your money who were toll takers. Now it's all, all automatic mostly. But um, when we're, we're here, noticing the breath, waiting for the breath, if we aren't in touch with it, then we just wait. And this is a great place to notice the serenity of what's happening is um, that we don't have to do anything else. You know, how many times in your day do you have when really you don't have to do anything? So this is part of the serenity aspect is that we're sitting, we're noticing our breath. If the breath isn't that noticeable, then we wait. And this also helps increase the concentration because it does take a certain amount of concentration in order to notice the breath there. And um, as the practice deepens, as our concentration increases, I've been teaching this a long time now and I've taught you know, many thousands of people and there hasn't been anyone that I've met so far who couldn't with time actually um, notice the breath there. So really the advice would be to stay with it. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at the chat and see if there are questions and um, take some questions. So let's look at the chat here. Hi, Chris, thanks for your comments. Nice to see you out there somewhere. Um, we are both the program and the programmer, yeah. I mean, that's really, I think this is part of why this practice has lasted so long is that it's kind of miraculous actually, that by doing something as simple as sitting and paying attention to our breath and coming back, to the breath with kindness, with gentleness. We don't need to beat ourselves up if we find we've gone off in thought 
just come back. You don't need to add that extra suffering to it. Um, that that actually does something to our consciousness that they can now measure in neuroscience. I've actually been studied by Yale Neuroscience Lab, and there's a whole write-up about the study I was in, which is pretty interesting. And then, you know, there's hundreds of studies a year. Let's see what else. Yeah, so I will um, I will do a guided meditation in a minute, but part of I was talking about building the muscle of the concentration and part of it is that if I guide the entire thing, then it's like me being your personal trainer and instead of you lifting the weight, I'm doing this for you. The way you actually build your own capacity is to be doing this on your own without um, having, having this, the level of support of me talking the entire time. So there'll be times when I come back and do reminders and other times when you'll be coming to the breath, back to the breath on your own. And I'll give those instructions in a minute. Uh, someone's asking about the stages of sila, samatha, and vipassana. They really don't need to be sequential. They are all, you know, they all inform each other, and we weave through all three of them um, on an ongoing basis. So they aren't, um, I, you know, I, I describe them in a sequential way, but they don't have to be sequential um, like that. Let's see. Yeah, so the breath in the nostrils and whole body breathing. Um, it's a, not doesn't have to be just the nostril. It's really anywhere in the area between the upper lip and the nostril. So it could be a general generalized area or it could be a specific spot, whatever is easier for you. The whole breath body is really used in Vipassana, and that's a great thing to use in Vipassana or insight meditation or mindfulness, where you're noticing the breath in your entire body when you're doing that kind of practice, that's totally fine. So I'm not saying that isn't a good thing, it's just different kinds of meditation are cultivating different things in our um, capacity and our consciousness, and so they're not doing exactly the same thing. Again, noticing the breath in the abdomen is great when you're doing mindfulness and Vipassana. In this, we're using a smaller area because that is part of what brings the mind stream together. So it's fine to do the um, abdomen, belly breathing when you're doing a mindfulness practice or Vipassana, but in this, we're actually changing it a little because it's doing something different to our consciousness. And I think I'm going to go on to um, actually do the meditation because people are asking about that. Um, see anything. So normally we do this breathing through the nose. If I have had several students who had some kind of um, health issue or maybe a cold or some allergies, it's fine to do it through the mouth. It's a little bit harder but we can still notice the breath in this area, breathing through the mouth. So if that applies to you, feel free to um, do that. Okay, so, um, and somebody's saying it gets boring. Well, this is, it, it can get boring. Whatever thought patterns are coming up, these are things to notice and to, see whatever's coming up, they're happening in our life too. And usually they're things that end up causing us some kind of suffering. And this is helping us to find a place of serenity that isn't dependent like, you know, with boredom, that's one of the three main patterns in Buddhism is not being okay when things are neutral. And so really how does this affect us in our lives if we can't be okay when things are neutral? That's gonna cause a lot of suffering. So this is helping us be able to find a place of serenity 
without the external circumstances always being what we would prefer. Um, what to do with the eyes. So this is a closed eye meditation. If you normally meditate with your eyes open, that's fine. But normally the instruction would be um, that it's a closed eyes meditation. So we're going to do a sit now. I think I've gotten to um, most of the question categories and there'll be more time for questions later. So we'll do a sit um, for about 25 minutes. And so go ahead and find your ideal posture. And I think I'll go ahead and do some posture instructions. People often um, haven't had that. So I'll do some posture instructions just to set you up. In this practice, it's important to be comfortable. So find a way you can sit in a chair or Zafu or bench that's comfortable. Really feel your feet or your knees firmly planted on the ground. Feel the support of the earth, of the building that you're in, of the chair. Really surrender your body weight to what you're sitting on. Then moving up the legs. It's ideal to have your knees lower than your hips because this creates an S curve in the spine that you might know from seeing a skeleton hanging. That's the natural curve of the spine that helps us be upright without using our muscles too much. So see if your knees can be lower, you can move your feet out a little farther in front if you're in a chair. And then moving up to the hips, it's ideal to have the pelvis tilted just a little, and that's one of the advantages being on a Zafir or a bench, because this helps the S curve. Then going to the lower back, And just before I go up any further, while you're down in the seat area, feel if you're balanced from left to right so that you're not tipping from one side to another. This will help you stay upright for the sitting, not end up with a sore neck. And going up to the lower back and the belly, just let your belly relax. And you take a deep breath into the belly and just let it out. And the lower back, we want to go in to an, this is the inward part of the S curve. Helps keep the rest of our spine above it, upright. Then working our way up to the chest area. This is the upper part of the S curve. It's easy to collapse forward in a meditating. So you wanna feel that your chest is open your arms are relaxed and your shoulders are kind of relaxed on your back. And see if you can be upright without being, you know, rigid. You want to be relaxed, but have a feeling of uprightness and relaxation in the spine. Then go into the shoulders, see if you can have your shoulders be relaxed. Then your neck, necks hold a lot of tension. See if your neck can be relaxed, maybe make a few little movements, loosen it. Then going to the jaw. Let your jaw relax to where there's a, a little space between the jawbone and the skull. Let your face relax. Let your eyes just rest in the sockets. They don't need to do anything. Letting your scalp relax. And then seeing for your head as a whole, if you can just rest it right on top of the spine so that you don't have to use a lot of muscles to hold it up. Feeling your arms. 
Just gently resting with your hands in your lap or on your legs. And now doing one more scan over the whole body to see if you're upright and balanced and yet relaxed. Settling into your posture. And now we will focus on the breath. And the object of this meditation is to know the breath as it's going in and out in the area of the Anapana spot or region. This is the area between the upper lip and the nostril. Just letting the attention land there. Noticing the serenity of simply being with our breath. needing to do anything. Being the peace of being right here, right now. And if you notice that you've gone into thoughts, Gently bringing your awareness back without judgment or self-criticism. Feeling yourself settling. This is a time to just be present for yourself and not have to do anything else except notice the breath. I'll be silent for a few minutes so that you can build that muscle and I'll come back and do reminders periodically.
Noticing where your attention is now. If it's wandered, let's bring it back to the breath gently. And commitment to do your best to stay with the breath in this present moment. Noticing the serenity. Knowing that if you go off and need to come back, that you're building that muscle of concentration and your capacity to stay with what you've put your attention on. Noticing where your attention is now. And if it's done with the breath, feeling happy that you're staying with yourself in this present moment. And if it's wandering, gently bring it back, knowing that you're doing the repetitions and 
cultivating the serenity and the capacity to stay in the present moment with yourself. And in these last few minutes of practice, be bringing your commitment, not with a sense of striving or strain, but with 
sense of really bringing all of your presence to this present moment of breathing and knowing you're breathing in this area of the Anapana spot or region, being in this present moment, noticing the relaxation, the presence, and the commitment to really being with yourself in this present moment, using the breath as an anchor. <clears throat> 